to 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 13 through 17. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on Him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. And I'm sorry, I'm ending right in the middle of a sentence. But I'm stopping there for for now. There's three commands here. And uh, there could be a great old school Baptist message on these three commands. So let let me just summarize them for you. First of all, don't do what you used to do in your former ignorance. So prior to your conversion, prior to you knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you were involved and your heart was involved in actions and activities and thoughts and intents of, of your mind and desires of your heart that were wrong. They were, they were ungodly passions. So first of all, the Apostle Peter says, don't do that. And we just had a great talk about Peter and we can maybe see where he's coming from on that. Second of all, be holy in 95% of your conduct. It might be higher. 99%. No, be holy in all of your conduct for God is holy. And then thirdly, conduct yourself with fear towards God who judges your works. So there's some very um, uh, challenging words, shall we say. Be holy because God's holy. Don't do what you used to do. Conduct yourself with fear for, for, from a God who's going to judge your works. And make no bones about it, there is a battle warring for your soul. And you have a great enemy who wants to even as though you're believers, to rob you of your joy, of your happiness, of your satisfaction in God. He wants to undo you. He desires to leave you barren and fruitless, hopeless and despairing. You have a great enemy of your soul. Not only do you have an external enemy in Satan and his powers and his forces in this world, but you have an ongoing battle with your flesh. We, uh, as Baptists, do not believe in perfection. We're not going to arrive at perfection in this life. So sin, our own battle with sin, in our own heart, remaining flesh battle that we have, lays a great weight on us. We feel sin's lure and we feel sin's burden, and we're weighed down, and we recognize that we're on a battlefield. And we long to live as God's law requires us to live. That's in your heart. I know it is. It's in my heart, and I know that you who know Jesus Christ, it's in your heart to live as Peter just described to us. We long to obey. But like Paul, and like the other saints, all the other saints before us, we find another law waging war against us and taking us captive again to do the things that we hate. Now this is not a new or unique battle. You may think that your own personal battle is nobody could possibly imagine the greatness of that battle. Well, let me read you a very, very famous uh, portion of writing from John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress. How many of you have read Pilgrim's Progress? One and a half. One and a half people 
I've read Pilgrim's Progress. Um, it, it, used to, it used to be, I don't know if it still is, but it used to be the second best-selling book behind the Bible. I don't know if that's still the case or not. But John Bunyan, if you don't know, I'll give you a little bio on John Bunyan. I mean, he was a pastor, 1600s, when it was illegal to have any church meeting outside of the Church of England. And so he, uh, he was thrown in jail for much of his life, endured incredible amount of suffering, um, and uh, wrote most of what he wrote, which is, this is one volume of three of the works of John Bunyan, so large volumes, on little postcards his wife would bring down to the jail. I mean, just scrunch in as many words as he could, and then they'd deliver them to the, to the printer, and they'd put them on there. And he wrote every day, and many, many years he spent in jail. But he wrote in Pilgrim's Progress the story of a man named Christian. He was named Self, but he meets an evangelist who tells him about Jesus Christ. He's rescued from the city of destruction, and he's on the pathway to the celestial city. Does that sound familiar? And on the path to the celestial city, Bunyan describes him meeting with an enemy, Apollyon. So let me read this to you. In this combat, no man can imagine unless he has seen... I'm sorry, that's the end of where I'm reading. Let me start at the beginning of where I'm reading. Apollyon says to Christian, Thou hast already been unfaithful in thy service to him. The accuser accuses us. How do you think to receive anything from, from Jesus? Christian answers, Wherein, O Apollyon, have I been unfaithful to him? Apollyon answers, Thou didst faint at first setting out when you almost choked in the gulf of despond, and you did attempt wrong ways to rid yourself of your burden, whereas you should have stayed till the prince had taken it off. You slept sinfully, and you lost your choice thing, his scriptures. You were almost persuaded to go back at the sight of lions, and when uh, you talk of your journey and of what you've heard and seen, you are inwardly desirous of vainglory in all that you say and do. Have you heard the accuser come and accuse you? Oh, here's what's wrong with you. Here's what's wrong with you. And Christian answers, all of this is true and much more, which you have left out. But the prince who I serve and honor is merciful and ready to forgive and besides these infirmities possess me in thy country. For there I suck them in, and I have groaned under them, and been sorry for them, and have now obtained pardon from my prince. Apollyon broke into a grievous rage and said, I am an enemy of this prince, and I hate his person and his laws and his people, and I come out on purpose to withstand you. Apollyon, beware what you do, for I am in the king's highway, the way of holiness. Therefore, take heed to yourself. Then Apollyon straddled quite over the whole breadth of the way and said, I am void of fear in this matter. Prepare yourself to die, for I swear by my infernal den that thou shalt go no further. Here will I spill thy soul. And with that he threw a flaming dart at his breast, but Christian had a shield in his hand with which he caught it and so prevented the danger of that. Then did Christian draw, for he saw it was time to bestir himself, and Apollyon as fast made at him, throwing darts as thick as hail, by the which, notwithstanding all that Christian could do to avoid it, Apollyon wounded him in his head and in his hand and his foot. And this made Christian give a little back. Apollyon therefore followed his work, and Christian again took courage and resisted as manfully as he could. The sore combat lasted for about half a day, even till Christian was almost quite spent, for you must know that Christian, by reason of his wounds, grew weaker and weaker. Then Apollyon, espying his opportunity, began to gather up close to Christian, and wrestling with him, gave him a dreadful fall. And with that, Christian's sword flew out of his hand. Then said Apollyon, I am sure to have you now. And with that, he almost pressed him to death, so that Christian began to despair of life. But as God would have it, while Apollyon was fetching his last blow, thereby to make a full end of this good man, Christian nimbly stretched out his hand for his sword and caught it, saying, Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. And with that, he gave him a deadly thrust, which made him give back as one that had received his mortal wound. And Christian, perceiving that, made at him again, saying, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And with that, Apollyon spread forth his dragon wings and sped away, that Christian, for a season, saw him no more. 
That passage from Pilgrim's Progress aptly describes the battle that we find raging in our lives on a regular basis. And the means that Christian used to fight the battle, we're going to take a look at in just a moment. But I'll just say to you in this introduction, if, if only the only thing I have to tell you today is these three verses that I've read to you, you must obey, you must be holy, and you must stop sinning. How are you left feeling? If that's my only word to you, just stop it. Would you please stop sinning? Maybe you feel like, well, that's a good word. And there is a portion of that that is accurate, true, it is true. We wish to stop sinning. We wish to be holy. But if all I have to tell you is be good, do the right thing, I, for one, am left feeling very despairing because I find in myself a great enemy of my soul. And I find outside of myself a great enemy of my soul. One that overpowers me. Much of the church today, large evangelical church in the United States, uh, teaches what has been termed moralistic therapeutic deism. So moralistic, that's do good. Therapeutic, so you will feel better. Deism, because God said so. I, I, I don't know how what percent it is, but a large portion of our churches, that's either the main message or, or the only message that anybody receives. Do good, so you'll feel better, because God said so. Moralistic, therapeutic, deism. And we slip easily into this. It, it influences us. Even if we're faithful to the Word of God, we're trying to uh, be true to the Word, our natural human nature will do anything to have a self-salvation project. I will contribute something to my salvation, to my sanctification, to my change of heart. I must and will contribute. And we find ourselves on this really ungodly and unhelpful approach to obedience. There's another battle raging even among um, what I would consider solid Christian people whose books I love, whose preaching I love. There's, a, there's a, an argument, call it nice, a nice word, between how obedience gets applied to our lives. And one side of the argument says... Um, you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're already in, you have the Holy Spirit, and so what the church and what the people in the church need is the law of God to tell them what they should do. And that's sufficient. The law in and of itself is sufficient to change your heart and to, um, to lead you in the way that you should go. And while I agree that the law is does reveal the way that we should go. It does not empower the obedience that it requires. So, do we merely or mainly listen to the commands of Scripture, what do I just read out of Peter, and set out on the strength of that command alone, be holy, to obey, or is there something else that is required to enable my obedience? And I'm going to say, not surprisingly, that there is something else, and I want to take a look at that. So this section begins with the word therefore. So when you come to the word therefore, what are you supposed to do? See what it's there for, right? So let's do that. I want to take some time to look at the wider context of these commands and see how we are to obey and be holy and stop sinning. I can't tell you how many times at any given time in my life that I've sat in a sermon and the preacher says something that's right on, like, you need to stop being angry without a cause. Right out of the scripture. Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, what's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with that. But the whole message is, all the ways that I could be angry without a cause and be sinful in my anger, 
And so I'm sitting there, yeah, oh man, I'm convicted. Yes, that's me. I have anger. And the end of the message is, okay, now you know, don't do it anymore. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, that's it? That's all the help and hope that I have is that it's left to me to just figure it out, don't do it anymore? That's the answer? And I don't think that is the answer. And so I want to look in Peter the, and, and at four truths that undergird and enable genuine from the heart obedience. I say four, there's really six, but I didn't want to scare you. And so I'm going to put two in the conclusion and it'll be real quick. So, but, so we're going to look at four plus two. The greater we understand and embrace these four truths that Peter presents us with, the greater we, we will be empowered and enabled to obey from the heart those things that God requires of us. So let's turn back a page, or in my Bible, a page to verse 3 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3. And the first truth that we need to understand in order to practice genuine obedience is that we must understand our new birth. We must understand our new birth. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now I know that um, this teaching is somewhat controversial. I don't know if it's controversial here or not. But in the church at large, it's controversial to say that God causes us to be born again. And I'm not going to get way into that. We've talked about that in previous times that I've been here. But I want to say, I want to try and take the controversy out and just if that's true if it's true that God is the instigator of our new birth what does that mean for us so let me um, let me put it if it isn't that way let's say God just puts out the possibility for me to be saved and he just says look I died on the cross um I rose from the dead, and now I'm just going to present you with the offer of salvation. That's all I'm going to do. If you want to be saved, all you have to do is believe. But the belief is going to be generated by you, Ken McLean. If I'm left with that, as I'm the decisive final say in my own salvation, I've got to tell you that I'm... I'm very despairing. I'm very despairing. Because as I look at my life, and I evaluate the direction that my life would go apart from God giving me new birth, I would never in a million years choose righteousness. And the reason for that is what we already talked about, the enemy of my soul on the outside is Satan himself and the attraction, attraction and allurement of this world and then my own sinful flesh that propels me to fulfill the lusts and the desires of my mind. If you tell me that all there is is a, a God who makes it available or possible I'm not filled with hope. But if you tell me that there is a God who is not able, not only able to offer, but able to literally raise my heart from the dead, who reaches into this dead, sick, sinful soul and breathes new life and gives me a new heart, it's dependent on Him. He's the instigator. I love Him because He first loved me. If that's true, then I have hope. Because it's not dependent on me. It's dependent on the work of a sovereign God who loved me and gave Himself for me and didn't just make my rescue possible, but actually rescued me from the gates of hell. 
That gives me hope. Tolian Shavidjan, I've uh, been reading a lot of Tolian lately. If you don't know him, he's Billy Graham's grandson, pastor at Coral Ridge in Florida. He said this about grace and how it's one way. It comes to us not based on anything in me at all, but based on the sovereign will of God. Grace is love that seeks you out when you have nothing to give in return. Grace is love coming at you that has nothing to do with you. Grace is being loved when you are unlovable. The cliche definition of grace is unconditional love. It's a true cliche, for it is a good description of the thing. Let's go a little further, though. Grace is a love that has nothing to do with you, the beloved. It has everything and only to do with the lover. Grace is irrational in the sense that it has nothing to do with weights and measures. It has nothing to do with my intrinsic qualities or so-called gifts, whatever they may be. It reflects a decision on the part of the giver, the one who loves in relation to the receiver, the one who is loved, that negates any qualifications the receiver may personally hold. Grace is one-way love. That's powerful. And that's true. And the power that moves you from death to life is the same power that raised Christ from the dead, namely God's power and His alone. So now, if you're raised, if you're brought to life, if you're given new birth, as Peter says here, by the work of God, it's irrevocable. We're going to look at that in just a minute. But if it's, if it's me... If it's finally my decision and my will and my choice and my ability and something about me that's good that makes my salvation possible, then I can take that back. Something in me can change and will change. It will change. And so my hope is not secure unless God is the instigator, the provider, and the giver who irrevocably provides me with the grace that rescues me. Now, you might say, or you might think, well, if it's all of God, and it's all of grace, then I don't have to do anything. I mean, it doesn't matter how I live. It doesn't matter what I do. Well, I, if you say that, and Paul addresses that, says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? If, you, if you're saying that, though, if that's genuinely what's in your heart, and you're not just making an argument, then you do not understand the nature of grace. Grace empowers obedience. And there's no other way that genuine obedience happens except by grace. Genuine, from the heart, obedience is enabled by understanding that you have been raised from death to life by grace alone, and that understanding comes to you every day afresh. So truth number one is, you must understand your new birth, how you were born of God. Number two, embrace the permanence of your standing. Look at it, 1 Peter 4, or chapter 1, verse 4. He has caused us, I'm reading right before, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. So, embrace the permanence of your standing, which is our inheritance. An inheritance is something given to us. And there's three things I'm going to just say about what inheritance is when, when Peter's talking about it or where you see it in another scripture. First, it's a position. Your position given to you by the work of God, by the power of God, it says, is that you're a joint heir with Jesus. That means you're a member of the family of God. You are a child of the king. We just said, saying that. A child of the king. God is your father. Jesus is your brother. It's a standing that is given to you, not because of anything in you, but because of the work of God on your behalf. Totally on your behalf. Second, it's a place. 
Our inheritance were, were we just we sang it this morning. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am there you may be also. It is the dwelling place of God. And finally, our inheritance is a person. And ultimately, this our number one benefit of being a child of the God of God is that we um are placed into intimate relationship with our Creator. We, now it's through a glass darkly, but ultimately face to face. So that's our glorious inheritance that has been granted to us, not by anything in us, but by the work of God's grace in our lives. He's given us this. That inheritance is imperishable. That means it cannot be destroyed. If you're a child of the King now, you will always be a child of the King. If, you, uh, if you're... Um, headed to a mansion prepared for you, then you will always have that. It cannot be destroyed. And it's undefiled, meaning it cannot be corrupted. It won't be tainted. It will always be. And it's unfading so that nothing in it can be lessened. I mean, Peter's using as many descriptive words here as he can, it seems like. Imperishable, undefiled, unfading. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So now that inheritance does not come to you because you have been obeying. It's not granted to you at all based on your obedience. It is granted because of the obedience of Christ on the cross. God is the grantor and God is the guarantor of this inheritance. So it's not like God grants it and then if you mess up, it's going to be taken away. He is the guarantor of the inheritance. So our our obedience, though, is not out of some sort of duty and compulsion that is, uh, you know, if I don't measure up, if I don't uh, keep up with what God requires of me, then he's going to cast me out. He's going to throw me out. I'm never going to measure up. That's not the case. Our obedience is enabled by embracing the glorious reality that our future inheritance is guaranteed by God himself based on his work alone. So grace, I mean, we, we think that maybe people are going to take grace and, oh, I can get away with a lot here. I mean, it's all from God alone. He's given me inheritance. He can't take it back. He said right here, undefiled, unfading, and un- imperishable. So I got it. So it doesn't matter what I do. No, that is not what grace does to you. The effect of grace on your heart is that you long to please the one who granted you grace. The problem is that we all have this thing in our hearts that want to earn something. Please, let me do something. People hate being told what to do, but they hate even worse being told that they can't do anything. And grace says you have nothing to bring, you have nothing to offer. All has been done for you on the cross of Christ You have nothing. We hate that. I mean, we might receive that one time at salvation, and then for the rest of our Christian lives, we're gonna we're gonna pay God back. We're going to earn it now. Yeah, maybe he still has to make a a little bit, but man, I'm gonna do everything I can that I don't need is very much grace. That's not how it works. That's how our minds work. But it's not how it works in reality. The reality is that every day we're fully, 100% dependent on the grace of God. And And that grace enables and empowers genuine obedience that raw obedience can never bring. So second truth is embrace the permanence of your standing. Third truth, rejoice in the glorious one who is the Savior of your soul. Look at verse 6 now. 1 Peter 1 verse 6. In this you rejoice... Though now for a little while if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him with, and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So I have a couple things to say on this. This is rejoicing in the glorious one who is the savior of our soul. That is 
the definition of what faith is. That's the heart of faith. Faith is embracing the unseen one as our soul-satisfying treasure. That's Jesus. We embrace him by faith. So the ultimate and the largest end of our faith is not streets of gold. It's not even the forgiveness of sins. It's not the gifts that God has given you in this life to enjoy. Yes, those all come from grace, but the ultimate end of our faith and the ultimate prize of our faith is Jesus himself. Jesus is our life. Jesus is our joy. Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our salvation. He is the one who's more precious than gold. And he is our great treasure and the end for which we are made. Knowing that he is ours and we are his helps us to endure great trials with joy. So look at back in verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Now, there's a lot we could say about that, but first, one thing I want to point out particularly that I, as I was reading the commentaries on this, it said, it commented on if necessary. So, I mean, how many of you have had no trials in life? May I see your hands? No trials. Okay, everyone's had trials. Wow. Well, is God not paying attention? Is God not watching out for you? Taking care of you? If necessary implies that God is going to allow trials, but only necessary trials. Only trials that strengthen your faith so that you see its value and its worth in grasping onto the great treasure of your soul, Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of the trial. So you can trust a sovereign God who has allowed trials into your life because he's only going to allow what's necessary for the purpose of strengthening and testing your faith. Now you're not alone. I mean, I know that you know you're not alone, but sometimes you might feel alone anyway. I do. So I just, I love reading old believer stories. So Jonathan Edwards, the great, magnificent mind, I mean, even secular historians will ascribe to Jonathan Edwards, one of the brightest minds America has ever produced. He got fired from his church and spent the remaining of his years of his life preaching to Indians, which is great that he did that. But his church that he spent years and years in let him go over an issue over communion. John Bunyan, we just talked about, spent years in Bedford Jail, lost family members, was in deplorable conditions, and yet wrote much. And I, and I commend it to you. I mean, I would commend that you read Pilgrim's Progress if you haven't. Charles Spurgeon, great prince of preachers, struggled most of his life with depression. Horatio Spafford, who wrote it as well with my soul, lost his children. And that was to go with a, a number of other losses. His son had died prior to that. He lost his family business in the Chicago fire. So he was without money. He lost all of his children. And so why, why not just curse God and die, as Job's wife would say? And yet, Horatio Spadford gave us this great hymn, and I, I know you know the words, but just listen to them. Though Satan should buffet me, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. And Lord, haste that day when my faith shall be sight. And the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound. The Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. The various trials that you have experienced and are going to experience before the end of your life here on earth are not given apart from the sovereign hand of God and produce in us faith which embraces Jesus and yields 
joyful obedience to the Savior of our soul. What we talked about at the beginning, be holy as I am holy. Stop doing the things that you used to do. Those things don't just happen in a vacuum like that command's going to give you the strength to do it. The strength to obey comes from embracing what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ in His sovereignty over all things, including our salvation and our sufferings. One more truth. Number four, bask in the outlandishly good news of the gospel. Look at 1 Peter 1.10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels themselves long to look. So that's that's not necessarily super clear what he's saying there. So let me try and summarize it for you. One, he's saying, look at the good news of the gospel of what Christ has accomplished on our behalf on the cross and through the resurrection of the dead. Those things, the prophets, the great prophets of old, I mean, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they wrote about these things. But they didn't fully comprehend them. In fact, they were writing for your benefit. Because now you comprehend them. The church. And not only that, but angels have not reached the end of understanding the gospel. I don't know what that means. I just know what it says. The gospel has things that the angels are longing to look deeper into. To understand in their fullness and the beauty. And I think we're... We're in the church a lot of times so accustomed to, okay, Jesus died on the cross. I am thankful and I am grateful. But we're not overwhelmed. We're not shocked. And I think part of the reason why we're not shocked is that we don't, we don't see either extreme. We don't see the extreme um, corruption of our own hearts. And we don't see the extreme radical grace that God has given to us. So I thought, as, a, as we thinking of Pilgrim's Progress again this week, um, there's a scene where Christian is bound in a dungeon. And, and I'm going to go a little bit off of what Pilgrim's Progress said, but just imagine that you right now are bound. You're in a dungeon, shackles on your wrists, and you're guilty. You're a murderer. And you've just heard news that the judge is coming today. And your sentence is going to be carried out. And you know that you're guilty. And you know that the judge is the most fair and righteous judge that has ever been. And that there is no hope at all for you. I mean, that's our state. And the judge arrives, the proceedings are happening, you can hear them through the cell door, you can't quite make out the words, and the cell doors open, and you hear with, you just feel dread in your heart. And the judge walks in and says, I know that you're guilty. And the sentence for your crime is death. But I had my son pay the sentence. He paid the price for you. And not only are you free to go, but I've adopted you as my son or my daughter. And you may not be aware, but I own everything. And everything I have is yours. And I have made a future for you, and I have guaranteed the future by the death and resurrection of my son. I mean, that, if, you were, if you saw yourself in that condition, and the judge walks in and says that to you, you would probably not believe him. Which is why the gospel is hard to believe. So let the gospel be refreshed in your soul again, and anew. 
bask in the outlandishly good news that the gospel frees you from all the sentence of death that was against you and frees you to worship and obey your Savior and Lord from the heart. That's the, the good news does that. Not your new leaf, your new attempt that I'm going to finally get my life in order and do these things right. Your freedom from sin and freedom to obey is found in the good news of the gospel. So I'm going, to come in, I'm going to come in for landing. We're concluding right here. But look at verse 13. So this is the text we started with. And look now, he's going to go into these commands of what we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do. And he says, prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. <laughs> and set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's your hope. There is no obedience. There's no genuine from the heart obedience. There's hypocritical obedience if it is not based on setting your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You're just trying to look good. Or you're trying to earn something. The only true, genuine obedience springs from faith in the grace that you have received already and that is coming to you in the future, your guaranteed future. And then he gives the commands. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as you who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call him his father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Know that you were purchased by the costliest thing in the world. God purchased you and your soul and your life with his most costly thing, the blood of Jesus Christ. And he's never going to let you go. He is powerful and able to rescue you. Genuine obedience from the heart is enabled when we rest in this glorious one-sided rescue that has been granted us by the Father through His grace in giving us Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away our sins. When you believe that, when you embrace that, the more you believe that, the more you embrace it, like the angels who haven't got to the bottom of it, they still haven't reached the depths of the gospel, you continue to plumb the depths. And as you plumb the depths, your life will increasingly reflect the life of our Savior. Faith in our rescuer unlocks the obedience we long for in our Christian lives. I'm going to close with this illustration and one quote. Um, I love the Lord of the Rings. I read the books, read the books a few times, and I love the movies. The movies are fantastic. Okay? My parents don't like the movies. They can't understand them. So I don't know if there's a generational gap on the movies or what, but um, if you haven't seen the movies, maybe try the books. Um, but there's this great scene that I want to try to describe for you, whether you know the story or not. But... Um, the men of the earth, the kings, have taken their people, and there's great enemy destructive forces coming against them. Orcs and, I don't know, goblins and crazy things. And they're, they end up in this castle that's carved out of a rock. And they're doing everything they can to defend that castle, but at the end of a couple of days' battle, they see that the end is near. There's a million orcs outside, and there's not very many men left. And the orcs have a battering ram, and they're coming against the castle with a large battering ram. And one of the kings says, you know, there's no hope. We should just give up when they come in. There's nothing we can do. And he says a great line in the movie where he says, um, what can men do against such evil? 
I mean, I feel, I resonate with that. I mean, what can I do against the evil of my own heart and the evil that is outside of me? Nothing. I mean, I feel powerless. There's a million people outside, and it's just me in here. There's no hope. But the other king, Aragon, he looks and remembers the words of Gandalf, who plays a savior-like role. And Gandalf says, look for my coming on the morning of the fifth day. And it's the morning of the fifth day. And he remembers that, and he reminds the king, hey, Gandalf said he was coming with an army, with forces. Let's charge. Let's fight. And so the, ba- the gates are broken down, and this small little band of horses and men ride out against the enemy. And as they ride out, up on the ridge, high above all the sea of teeming evil orcs, Gandalf on a white horse with long flowing white hair, his horse rears up. And together him and his forces come charging down and totally decimate the orc army. Now, God is, in this analogy, if God is like Gandalf and the army, the forces, I mean, they are the ones who win the day. They are the power and the strength. But the fact that the army was the fight was going to be won by Gandalf and his army did not that inspired a fight from the people inside. They were despairing when they thought it was on their own. When they thought, hey, there's somebody else who can come to the rescue. There's someone who's powerful enough to defeat this army. That inspired obedience. In my analogy. So the hope that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done and continues to do and will do guaranteed for all of eternity is what enables you to have the hope and the ability and the strength to genuinely obey from the heart. You can't do it from raw obedience like I'm just going to muscle this up. You do it because of the work of God in you and for you and on your behalf because of the grace of God. And I leave you with this quote, again from Tully and Chivijan. Christian, here's the good news. Who you really are has nothing to do with you. How much you can accomplish, who you can become, your behavior, good or bad, your strength, your weaknesses, your sordid past, your family background, your education, your looks, and on and on. Your identity is firmly anchored in Christ's accomplishment, not yours. His strength not yours. His performance, not yours. His victory, not yours. Your identity is steadfastly established in His substitution, not your sin. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Your grace. Thank You that You love us. Thank You that You have a one-sided rescue of us. Lord, we're without hope but at just the right time you sent your your son to die on our behalf to pay our penalty to guarantee our future to secure it with a glorious inheritance and we just revel in and bask in the magnificent grace that you've shown us we don't understand why we can't reach the depths of your love for us and Lord we do long to obey you And so I ask that these truths would so penetrate our hearts, not just at this moment, but every morning, Lord, we need to remind ourselves in your word and remind ourselves as a church community of the greatness of your love for us that's not dependent on anything in us, but solely dependent on your sovereign will and your glorious pursuit of us. I pray that by your spirit you would allow these truths to sink in in a deeper way so that our obedience continues to grow in genuine from the heart obedience. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.